Welcome back. The Joint Chiefs of Staff is putting the finishing touches on a new joint warfighting concept. The data and information that will drive that concept will mean a dramatically different way of warfighting than the services prepare for today. Chris Doherty, senior fellow in the defense program at the Center for a New American Security. He's writing about next-gen warfare under the title More Than Half the Battle. Chris, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Why did you call this work that? More than half of what battle do you mean, Chris? Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me, Francis. Um, you know, the, the first part of it, it's a little bit of a, a sly reference to the old GI Joe uh, public service announcements used to come on after the cartoon, which was, you know, they say now you know, and knowing is half the battle. So I, I kind of was, a, it's a sly reference to that um, that some folks have, have cued in on. Um, but more than that, it really is um, central to how we will fight China and Russia, uh, or central at least to how they think about fighting us, is to attack the way that we manage information, the way we execute command. And, you know, if, if you come to one of our war games, you'd see this every single time the way the war starts is with China or Russia making concerted attacks against our command control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance networks, otherwise known in Pentagonese as C4ISR. Um, and those attacks are so predictable that you can essentially script them out. And what happens is that they leave the U.S. commanders um, without proper situational awareness, without an ability to build a targeting picture, without an ability to share their information around the, the, the combat environment, and with about, without an ability to make effective decisions. And what that means is that China and Russia, until the United States can reconstitute that capability, um, they have a, a huge window of opportunity in which they can seize their objectives. There are four lines of effort that you write about in this work. One is forcing China and Russia into dilemmas about expanding or escalating a conflict. How would we go about doing that, Chris? I think we go about doing that by how we posture our forces and how we operate. And we force them to make decisions between allowing us to keep our systems operational, to not attack our systems, or to reach into third party countries or into places and spaces that they don't want to attack. For example, the US homeland. So in one of our uh, war games, um, the blue team took the combined air operations center from which is usually located in Ramstein Air Base in Germany and relocated it to Shaw Air Force Base in North Carolina, um, which is a lot like what um, CENTCOM did recently when they relocated the combined air operations center of KAOC it, that's usually at Al-Udaid in Qatar and relocated to Pope Air Force Base. And this, so this is something we can do, and it presents them with, with this dilemma of, I know I want to attack the Combined Air Operations Center because that's the nerve center that controls all U.S. air operations in this theater, and I know that I need to shut that down. But at the same time, I'm not quite willing to go and reach into the homeland and conduct kinetic strikes in the U.S. homeland in a fight over Eastern Latvia. And so I think if we can pose them with those dilemmas, with these difficult choices, I think we can improve our deterrence posture and improve our ability to respond to their sort of subconventional behavior as well. The second line of effort that you write about is leveling the playing field in the peacetime information environment. Using the word leveling implies to me that you think it's not level now and that maybe we're behind. Am I reading that right? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I would say we're very far behind um, in large part because we just haven't been focusing on it for you know 20 or 30 years. And I think also in part because it's not part of DOD's traditional core competency. Um, information operations is something that DOD does, um, but sort of holds at arm's length. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that, both cultural and also legal inside the United States, some of the restrictions on what we can and can't do. Um, and that's why I think one of the first things we have to do is sort out the authorities for doing these sorts of activities, um, particularly in third party countries that are either allies or partners, um, because you know we don't want to erode our trust with them by going in and conducting you know, info ops in their territory, but at the same time, we know that we have to do these sorts of things because the Russians and Chinese are pushing quite hard in the information environment. In the third one, I, I had to get my dictionary out and it still didn't help. The third one is achieving degradation dominance in the techno-cognitive confrontation. <laughs> what does techno-cognitive even mean, Chris? So from my perspective, um, imagine for a moment that you're going to research something and imagine doing it without Google. Um, or imagine you're going to go shopping for something, but you were going to do it with Amazon. Um, I think at some point, certain parts of the technological space and the information technology we become accustomed to using is so fused with our way of thinking that they're impossible to extricate from one another. And I think the same thing goes in DOD. Um, I think about things like land navigation. At some point, we have lost our ability to do land navigation or, or navigation, um, whether I, I, I'm an army guy, so I think about land navigation, but I'm sure um, you know my Navy brothers would say, yeah, you know that applies at sea as well. Um, but my point being that we've lost our ability to do these things without GPS. Like we rely on that technology to, to execute the cognitive function of navigation. And I think the 
every place that you can see that is an avenue for China and Russia to use those technologies as an entry point into our cognitive processes and disrupt our ability to do the things that we have to do as a joint force. And so I think you have to think about that, that confrontation as a constant thing that's going on all the time, every day, 24 seven, 365, and it will only ramp up in intensity during a crisis or during a conflict. All right, the fourth one is organizing and training for degraded and disrupted multi-domain operations. Are we not doing that now? That doesn't sound like a good thing if we're not. I would argue that we do it, but in very limited ways, um, and we don't do it to nearly the, the degree or intensity that we need to as a joint force. And I think the training area might be a little bit further ahead of the organizational area. Um, I think you know we're increasingly incorporating things like information operations, um, like electronic warfare and cyber operations into large training exercises like you know, red flag, for example, for the Air Force. Um, but I don't think we've actually gone to the degree of organizational reform and change that we need to in order to operate in the sort of more, what the Chinese would call the informationized warfare. Um, and I think what we've seen is that we've made some organizational changes over the last 20 years, particularly places like special operations in order to respond to um, you know, the, the kinds of wars we've been fighting, these irregular wars and counterterrorism conflicts. Um, but I think there is a whole nother level of, of integration at the joint level and of pushing critical capabilities down to lower echelons of command that'll be necessary in order to operate degraded. Because if we posit that forces operating forward inside, you know, the first island chain, inside, you know, the Philippines, Japan, in a crisis or conflict with China, they won't have that constant high bandwidth reach back to either the joint task force commander in Japan or to the combatant commander in, in uh, of US indo pacom in Hawaii, they have to have the capabilities and joint structure that they need forward in those locations without depending on that constant reach back. And we just don't organize ourselves that way today. We rely on communications capabilities to bring that organization together. And I think if those communications capabilities aren't going to be there or they're not going to be reliable, then we have to change the way that we organize our forces to address that. Chris Doherty, it's a fascinating work. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you so much.